Now, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn with you, please, to John chapter 8. John chapter 8 is page 1126 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. I'm going to speak to you today on this line of thought, the battle of the ages. What is the battle of the ages? We want to find out what the battle of the ages is this morning. And I want you to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. Remember, you can get this tape by number or by title. The Battle of the Ages are tape number 155. Now, if you have that Bible open at John chapter 8, if you have a Schofield reference Bible, just flip right over to page 12, 1126. I begin reading with verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but you cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. You judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy Father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my Father. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. These words spake Jesus in the treasure, as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Now what is the real battle of the ages? What has it been? What is it now? What would it be in the future? The real battle of the ages. The answer is, the battle of the ages is, who is this man Jesus? Who is this man Jesus? Is he really God? Now the Russellites, Jehovah's Witnesses so-called, the Nohelites, they say he was just another man. Other religions in the world say he was a good prophet. And you have others say he, he was a good man. But who is this man Jesus? Is he God? Now, if he's God, we need to know that. We need to realize that. And the answer is in the affirmative. He is the true God, the Bible tells us. Therefore, if Jesus Christ is God, the Russellites, the cults in the world today that deny he's God have no chance of going to heaven. They'll die and go to a hell they don't believe in and be tormented forever because no man can believe that Jesus Christ can, can uh, say he's not Jesus Christ, refuse to believe Jesus Christ is God and still go to heaven. That was a dear Jewish friend one time talking to a preacher friend of mine. And this uh, Jewish friend said to this preacher friend of mine, said, I don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. I believe he was just a good man. And this preacher looked him in the eyes and said, well, now he never did anything wrong, did he? He never told a lie. And but now if he, he's, if he you say he's a good man, if he's not God, then you accuse him of lying. And if he lied, then he's not a good man. And he said, not only that, but he said, now you're looking for the Messiah to come. And Jesus, when he came the first time, he fulfilled literally and minutely every Old Testament prophecy to be fulfilled. Everyone in the Old Testament that the Bible said would be fulfilled by the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ fulfilled every last one of them. And he said, now you say you're still looking for your Messiah. And if he should come, he couldn't do any more than the one that's already come. And if he fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies, then he wouldn't have done any more uh, than the one that's already come. He said, you know, preacher, I hadn't thought about it in that light. Now, Jesus Christ was a true Messiah. He did come about 2,000 years ago. And the battleground from that time until now, who is this man? Was he the true Messiah? Was he just a good man? Was he just another prophet? Or was he very God? The Bible tells us he's very God. Jesus himself said he was very God. Now I want to prove his deity today by some things he did not do and by some things that he did do. Number one, nowhere in the Bible do you find that Jesus ever sought any advice. Nowhere did Jesus ever uh, sought any advice whatsoever from anyone. Secondly, he never changed his mind. There's no place in the Bible where Jesus really changed his mind. Thirdly, he never made a mistake. Here is a man that never made surprise. There's nothing that ever happened that caused Jesus to show surprise because he was God. He was omniscient 
and he knew all things and he never showed surprise at anything that happened number six he never showed any personal fear you don't find in the bible anywhere where jesus ever showed any personal fear whatsoever not only that number seven he never denied a good request when someone came to jesus asking a good request he never denied that good request not only that he was never defeated in a controversy the pharisees the sadducees the herodians and others came and tried to catch christ in his words but he was never defeated in his, in a controversy whatsoever not only that but number nine he never got in a hurry you don't find any place in the bible where jesus ever got in a hurry he was god yet he turned to do what he wanted to do and he never got in a hurry while he was on the earth and then number 10 he never distrusted his father never nowhere in the bible do you find why jesus ever distrusted god the father not one time and then number 11 he never asked anybody to pray for him most of us you know we go around and say i want you to pray for me i need your prayers but nowhere in the bible did jesus ever ask them to pray for him the reason he was very god we're to pray in his name he needed nobody to pray for him it'd be foolish to pray for the son of god he was very god no doubt about that. I've given you 11 things that Jesus did not do. That ought to help you establish the fact of his deity in your hearts and minds. I know you here in this auditorium. There's nobody here, I'm sure, that denies that Jesus Christ is God. I'm quite sure of that. But there may be somebody in the radio listening audience that has a question in your mind as to whether or not Jesus Christ is very God. He said he was. Paul said he was. God the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I well please. And so we know he was very God. Now let's just mention a few things that he did that proves his deity. You may say, now preach Edwards, has this been the battle of the ages? This has been the battle of the ages from the time that Jesus Christ came to this world until this present hour. The liberals, the infidels, the modernists do not believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. They do not believe in the deity of Christ. They do not believe in the bodily resurrection. They do not do believe in the blood atonement. No man, are you listening to me? No man can deny the virgin birth of Jesus Christ and be saved. Now a man might be saved and be in ignorance pertaining to the virgin birth, but when he hears that Jesus Christ was virgin born, he'll accept that. The Holy Ghost in him will say, yes, that's true. Now most sinners today, when they're saved, they know nothing about the Bible. They haven't read it very much. They haven't heard much about it. But when they hear these great fundamentals of the faith, like the virgin birth, the bodily resurrection, the deity of Christ, the, the blood atonement, and, and his coming again, they don't deny that. There's something on the inside of them that says, amen, that is the truth. Now, that happened to me. When God saved me, I didn't know the Old Testament from the New. And uh, I didn't know anything about these great doctrines. I repent of my sins, received Christ as my Savior, and when I heard the man of God preach it and when I read it in the Bible, there's something on the inside of me that registered, said, yes, that is it. I have never doubted these great doctrines and never will. They are true. And Jesus Christ is very God. Now, what did he do? Well, we find that he forgave human sins. Only God can forgive human sins. Nobody can forgive sin but God. The Bible says in Mark chapter 2 and verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said on the sick of the apostles, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now it's clear in the Bible, it's established fact. No man can pardon another man from his sins but God. And Jesus Christ was very God. That's why he forgave sins. Now you can forgive people for doing something wrong and mistreating you. And they'll say, I want you to forgive me. You can do that. But you can't forgive people of their sins. It's foolish to go to some man and confess your sins to some man, thinking he can tell God about it and get you cleansed of those sins. You have people by the multitudes, uh, you have multitudes of people rather in the land today that go and confess their sins to some old apostate, expecting that old apostate to go to God and uh, go to Mary and get that person cleansed from his sins. Beloved, that never happens. That's a trick of Satan. Only God can forgive you of your sins and the only way God will ever forgive you of your sins is for you to repent and accept Christ as your Savior. And then doing your sojourn as a Christian, when you feel like you ought to confess some sin, you confess that to God. 
If you want to counsel with somebody about it, talk with someone, tell them to pray with you about it, that's perfectly all right. Nothing wrong in that. But you yourself will have to confess your sins to God and ask God to forgive you. I can't come and say, now, Lord, so-and-so has committed the sin. I want you to forgive them. I can't do that. You and you alone is the only one that can do that and really get it done. So Jesus Christ is very God. He forgave sins. Not only that, but secondly, he accepted human worship. Now, if Jesus Christ was not God, he should have been stoned to death. The Old Testament plainly says, There should be no other gods before thee. Now, if Jesus Christ was not God, they should have carried him out and stoned him to death because that's what the Bible said to do to him. But he was very God, and he accepted human worship. And because he accepted human worship, he was very God. He proved that in doing so. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 33, the Bible said, Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Now, if Jesus Christ accepted human worship, and he was not God, uh, he's an idolater. That is, he caused people to commit idolatry. And God hates idolatry. That's the very first of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before thee. But Jesus Christ accepted human worship. Now, there's a man in the world today. He loves for people to bow down and kiss his toe. He just loves for people to kiss the ring on his hands. He just loves for people to bow down to him as though he was God. That man is accepting human worship as abomination in sight of God Almighty and his idolatry of the worst kind, and God hates it. No human being should accept worship. Only God. He's the only person in the world that you should ever worship. Now, you may say, preach Edwards, can't we worship the old apostles and, and the prophets and the Virgin Mary and angels? No, no. At any time you pray to some prophet or some apostle or some preacher or some angel or seraphim or cherubim or you pray to the Virgin Mary, you're committing idolatry of the worst kind. You're committing a terrible sin. You're breaking the very first commandment if you pray to anyone other than God. And Jesus Christ is God. And he tells you how to pray. And he accepted human worship. So you're to pray to no one but God Almighty. And you must keep that in mind. And Jesus is God. He accepted human worship. And not only that, but he defeated the devil without any help. Beloved, listen to me. Jesus Christ is the only one that can handle the devil and doesn't need anybody's help to do it. Because he is God. We find in the little epistle of Jude verse 9. Yet Michael the archangel, when continued with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a raven accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. When Michael came down to get the body of Moses, that Moses might come back on the mountain of transfiguration, that Moses might come back during the tribulation period in Revelation 11, God needed that body. Elijah had already gone on to heaven. And they were the two to come back. And so God said, I want the body of Moses. Michael came down to get that body. The devil appeared on the scene, put up a fuss. And the devil said, you can't get that body. You can't take that body here from the earth. It's been buried. You can't do it. And Michael said, I'm not going to argue with you about the body of Moses. The Lord will rebuke you. And Michael turned him over to the Lord, and the Lord took care of him. Did he get the body? He surely did. Moses came back in that body in Matthew 17. He'll come back again in that body in Revelation 11. And so we see Jesus Christ is the only one that can defeat the devil without any help whatsoever. And so we'll mention some things that he did. Now, let's notice number three, what he claimed. Now, Jesus Christ, in proving he's very God, claimed some things. This is the very battle of the ages. Who is this man, Jesus? Is he God? The modernists say no. They say he's just a good man. The liberals say no, he's just a good man. The infidels say no, he was just a good man. But Jesus Christ is very God. This is the battleground of the ages. In most of our theological seminaries today, they were established by godly men, but they eventually went modern. And they have many, many professors in the universities and colleges today that do not believe in the infallibility of this book. They do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. You'd be surprised whenever they check the ministerial students in some of these liberal seminaries today to find out how many ministerial students that do not believe in the virgin birth, that do not believe in the blood atonement, that do not believe in the infallibility of the word of God. They deny these things. This is the battleground. That's why the true Bible believers, the fundamentalists, must stand true and contend for the faith. That's why the battle is raging. 
The battle is raging today between the liberals, the infidels, the moderates, and the fundamentalists. They're doing everything under heaven today to smear the name of the fundamentalists. Let some cult come along and commit a lot of sins like Jim Jones or others or Sun Yon Moon or some of that crowd. Then they say they're fundamentalists. See, they're trying to smear the name of the fundamentalists. It's the fundamental Bible believers today that's taking the stand for the faith. The men that believe the book of God and the liberals, the infidels or crooked politicians today is trying to smear the name fundamentalists. I'm a fundamentalist. I'm proud of it. I always will be. I don't care what the devil has to say about it. And so what did Jesus claim? He claimed he came down from heaven. Jesus said, I came down from heaven. In John chapter 8 and verse 23, and he said unto them, ye are from beneath, I'm from above. Did Jesus Christ come down from heaven? He sure did. In due time, he came down born of the virgin. Not only that, he claimed to be the Messiah. Jesus said, I am that Messiah that you've been looking for. He claimed to be the Messiah. God cannot lie, and he is the Messiah. We know the dear Jewish people today, bless their hearts, they missed him. They have a veil over their faces in regard to spirituality. They missed the first Messiah. They're in blindness today. They're still looking for the Messiah to come. But Jesus said, I am that Messiah. We find in John chapter 4, verses 25 and 26, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he'll tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 4, verses 25 and 26, he said, I that speak unto thee am he. I am that Messiah. And he was that Messiah that to look for. The Bible first told about in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Not only that, he claimed to be equal with God. Here's a man walking on the earth claiming to be equal with God. Was he? Absolutely right. He claimed to be equal with God. In John chapter 5, verse 18, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because not only had he broken the Sabbath, but he said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. He claimed to be equal with God. He did right. He was equal with God. He was very God. In John chapter 10 and verse 30, he said, I and my father are one. Jesus said that. He could not lie. He was very God. And then number four, he claimed to be sinless. Here's a man, the only man that ever lived on this earth that could rightly claim to be sinless. He never committed a sin from the cradle to the grave. Not one time did Jesus ever do anything wrong. He was a sinless one, the perfect one. In John chapter 8 and verse 46, Jesus looked at that crowd of Pharisees and Sadducees. He said, which one of you can convince me of sin? Who out there can prove I've ever committed a sin? Not a one of them. We find that Pontius Pilate uh, said he found no fault in him seven different times. Simon Peter said there was no guile in his mouth. Beloved, Jesus Christ never committed a sin from the cradle of the grave in omission or commission because he was very God. He was sinless. Not only that, but he claimed, number five, to be pre-existence. He said, I was before Abraham. In John chapter 8 and verse 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now he was talking about Abraham. And he said, now before Abraham ever came on the scene, he said, I was. He is with God the Father before Abraham. And when he said that, of course, they wanted to stone him to death. But he did exist before Abraham. Yonder in heaven, in due time, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, in the fullness of time, Jesus came, born of a woman. But he was before Abraham. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, God said to Moses, I am that I am. And Jesus said in John 8, 58, I am that I am. And so Jesus was the great I am. In John chapter 1 and verse 18, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Jesus said, I was yonder in the bosom of the Father. I have come to declare him to you. He was very God. Number seven, he claimed to be the Son of God. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 24, the Son of Man goeth as written of him, but woe unto him by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Verse 64. Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in clouds in great glory. So he claimed to be the Son of God. In John chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and have you not known me, Philip? He has, that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? Jesus said, I and the Father, we are one. Jesus Christ is very God. Then notice what the Spirit of God said about him. 
The Spirit of God said He is the true God. Now here's some verses you ought to jot down. And when you run into these no hellites, these Russellites, uh, give them these verses of Scripture, give them a lockjaw. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 20, He said, This is the true God and eternal life. Talking about Jesus Christ. Said He is the true God. That's what the Bible said. And then in Titus chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, said Jesus Christ is that true God. So Jesus Christ is very God, and he was sinless, a perfect son of God, came down to this earth, died that terrible, ignominious death on Calvary, that you and I might have eternal life. God has done all he's going to do to keep you out of hell. God is sending his message, his preachers, his witnesses, to keep you out of hell. If you say no to God and die in your sins, you'll burn in hell to the judgment and then be sent to the lake of fire. Beloved, you can't afford to miss heaven. You can't live in this life and, and face the terrible testings and heartaches and disappointments that you face in this life and then go to hell. Beloved, hell is an awful place. You don't have to go there. You can be saved. And if you're here this morning without God, I want you to give your heart to the Lord Jesus and let God come into your heart and save your never dying soul. I want everybody to stand with you, please. We're going to have a word of prayer. And the triple has the second invitation number. And if you're in this building, a backslider, a lost sinner, or you want to join this church the way we receive members, I want you to obey God and do what God tells you to do. Our Father, we thank Thee that Jesus is very God. He is the Savior. We thank He is our Lord. God, there may be somebody here in the radio listening audience that's not saved today. Speak to their hearts. May they realize, behold, today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is accepted time. God, move upon the scene. Have you in this invitation? I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now, while they sing, would you come if God's speaking to you? We'll be right here to help you. Would you come? If God is speaking, no better time would you find to get saved to come back to the Lord. Yes, no better time. No better time would you ever find. One more stanza if God is speaking. This is your opportune time. Do something about it. Would you like to join this church? Or would you like to come back to God? Would you like to get saved? Now is the time to come. Come on right now. I'm coming. Oh. 